The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 12520 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on the European Conference for Coldwater Island Tourism. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I would also be grateful if guests leaving the gallery could do so quietly, please. This Parliament is still in session. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson, please, to open the debate. Seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to open the debate on cold water island tourism. I hope to reveal in due course the significant impact Scottish island tourism can have and does have on the Scottish economy. I would first like to take this opportunity to thank all those who signed my motion and the delegates who are attending and supporting Scotland's first cold water island tourism conference currently being held in Arran in my constituency, particularly Alistair Dobson of A Taste of Arran, who has worked so hard to bring the event to fruition and make it a success. More than 100 representatives from Northern Europe have gathered to share their insight and experience of the successes and struggles facing the cold water island tourism sector. The conference will benefit Arran directly as a fantastic introduction to one of the many alluring islands on the Scottish coast. It is a great way to promote the natural beauty of our cold water islands. An experience of Arran and its hospitality is a great way of stimulating international interest in Scotland's islands. And just before I came down to First Minister's questions, I was contacted uh, by Alistair Dobson, and he said some of the key themes that are coming out of the conference are, and I'll just touch on these, that islands go a long way to defining a nation, that the identity of each island is key to its success, that what is important is business-led joint and collaborative investment, and that, as I'm sure many of us already know, islands are fragile, but usually, usually dynamic and innovative. This past year has seen Scotland play host to many prestigious events, uh, presiding officer, bringing us to the international stage and amplifying interest in Scotland as a global tourism destination. The 2014 Commonwealth Games, Raider Cup and even the independence referendum all contributed and built on earlier events like the success of media productions such as 2012's Disney, Pixar's Brave and renewed international visitors' interest in Scotland helping to propagate an idea of our country as one of beautiful landscapes, castles and coasts, with good food and great people. Scotland's waters, our islands and indeed mainland coastal communities offer tourists a unique opportunity to experience Scotland on, an, on a more intimate scale. We boast the longest coastline in Europe, with varied wildlife and unparalleled scenery. Each island is unique, with a proud identity of its own and offers its own rich heritage. And with 88% of island tourism generated through small businesses, our islands allow tourists to experience a different, very Scottish experience. The increased interest in Scotland, in combination with the devolved powers that could see this Parliament in charge of an increasing number of key levers that determine the success of our tourism sector, creates a significant opportunity for the Scottish Government. Tourism presents represents 5% of total Scottish GDP, generating £10 billion of economic activity annually and employing 200,000 people, 8.5% uh, of overall uh, employment in Scotland. Supporting Scottish tourism affirms our commitment to developing and sustaining fragile communities that depend on the tourism industry. Our islands are particular concern given they are often relatively isolated from the main population centres on the mainland and the cost of doing business is significantly higher, even where road equivalent tariff and other initiatives are in place. And so island communities have to work harder to earn uh, their living in this modern world. The Arm Conference seeks to create a platform for communication between cold water islands in Europe in an attempt to share their ideas, experience and economic development in the tourism sector. Sharing insights is fundamental to growth. The European Conference for Cold Water Tourism creates an arena for island communities to talk about what works for them and to discuss innovative strategies to build a sustainable future for themselves. Of course, there are already several strategies underway in Scotland to promote marine tourism and sustainable island tourism. But as this is a European conference, it seems appropriate to touch on the European Union's hugely ambitious blue growth strategy. This was developed by the EU in an attempt to promote sustainable growth in European island communities with the aim of creating 5.4 million jobs and produce 500 billion euros of income per annum by 2020, along with uh, mainland coastal communities. This strategy stresses the importance of renewable energy, aquaculture, seabed mining and blue biotechnology as the building blocks of sustainable development. 
The Scottish Government's target of producing 100% of Scotland's gross annual electricity consumption and 11% of Scotland's heat consumption by 2020 from renewables supports these initiatives and will obviously generate jobs in the process. And I'm pleased that EU MARI Directors uh, Special Advisor Johan Gilly attended the conference uh, in Arran uh, to talk about the Blue Growth Strategy in more detail and provide support on innovation and communication in cold water island tourism developments. The Scottish Government, of course, supports, uh, supports sustainable development for Scotland's island tourism sector, but rather than provide details of this and steal the Minister's thunder, uh, I'm happy to wait for him to touch on those himself. In addition, the Scottish Tourism Alliance, working in tandem with Tourism Minister Fergus Ewing, recently launched the Marine Tourism Strategy, which, as the name suggests, aims to bolster Scotland's marine tourism, a hugely important sector and an area my colleague Stuart McMillan takes a keen interest in, and I'm sure we'll hear from him before too long on that. The five-year plan aims to improve the tourism experience, develop skills and facilities within the sector, and promote events and activities intended to bring much more focus to Scotland marine tourism. The STA hopes to achieve a 25% increase in the total value of the sector by 2020, representing an increase of around £90 million in income per year. So, tourism gains from events and in many other ways, such as cruising. The Scottish Government is working with Cruise Scotland and Visit Scotland to continue to grow this market too. As we move forward, uh, uh, devolving responsibility for air passenger duty, if it happens, will give us the opportunity to end a burden that since 2007 has resulted in £210 million less per annum being spent on tourism and 1.2 million fewer visitors. Money lost across Scotland, not just to our island communities, of course, but being further away uh, from tourists when they arrive in the UK uh, does not help. Presiding officer, I look forward to hearing how the Scottish Government will further promote island tourism and indeed uh, from other colleagues in this debate. The European Conference on Cold Water Island Tourism represents an excellent example of the potential heralded by collaboration across uh, similar uh, islands and I uh, to those in Scotland. And I believe the success of the Island Conference will encourage countries to share their findings and promote sustainable prosperity for our islands for many years to come. Thank you. Many thanks. I now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes or so. Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, presiding officer, I'm very well qualified, I think, to speak in this uh, debate because it's uh, 44 years since I've been to a warm water island. But in the last uh, seven years, I have holidayed in Arran. I mentioned that first, of course, for obvious reason, and congratulate Kenny Gibson for bringing the debate uh, in Arran. Uh, Tyree, Sky, Orkney and Harris and I can testify to the coldness uh, of the water because of a little bit uh, of swimming in some of those islands. Coldwater islands, particularly those in the North Atlantic, face common tourism opportunities and challenges and the conference was set up, uh, I am told, and Kenny Gibson has reminded us, to consider strategies for economic growth and using these um, uh, islands' natural resources. Tourism is a mainstay of these communities and therefore plays an essential part in their sustained livelihood. Island tourism, and this is quoting from Alastair Dobson of Visit Aran, island tourism tends to focus on warm water locations such as the Mediterranean, the Caribbean and the Pacific Ocean. Cold water island tourism, he goes on to say, is vitally important to the economy for the island communities, but importantly, cold water islands offer tourists a wonderful opportunity to get close to nature and to experience authentic island life. And for northern European markets, these experiences are much closer to home. And it's certainly true of Aaron, and Kenny Gibson will be glad to know. I was telling an American uh, intern in the Parliament all about Aaron this morning, where she's going uh, for the next uh, couple of days. One of the case studies at the conference uh, was under the banner food and drink, and one of the case studies was the highly successful collaborative venture Taste of Aran. Uh, the joined-up approach uh, of, of that initiative to the development and marketing of local produce provides a template from which other similar islands could replicate. It incorporates both the development of the product as part of an experience on the island and also serves as a fundamental component of the branding, positioning and marketing of Aran. The success of the islands, both at the high and low season, is as dependent on their wider connectivity as much as on their ability to articulate a distinct brand. Connectivity is an integral part of developing innovative tourism strategies for islands, and I believe this was reflected in the discussions this week as well. One experience of island tourism we'll all be familiar with is the trip aboard CalMac ferries on ships and that, that have connected our communities for many years. They have recently announced plans to turn the journey into an opportunity to promote Scottish culture and products while using digital connectivity to encourage travellers to visit key sites of interest. 
The ferry company planned to introduce pop-up tastings, fashion shows and pop music to entertain visitors as they head to Scotland's island. In a move designed to give tourists a flavour of what awaits them, Carmack will serve locally produced island food and drink, along with tourist information via free Wi-Fi. Details of places to visit on the island where the ferry is heading will be sent to passengers' mobile phones and via a smartphone app. This is, in essence, what maximising our island potential is all about. Key sectors working in collaboration to make sure the overall enjoyment of visiting the island leads to supporting the island economy and buying into the ethos. The Sense of Destination package will be available on ferries to the Hebrides. Clyde routes such as Arran will also be included. Carmack have also become adept in their use of social media to promote their various destinations. Their new blog site, for example, offers a glimpse of the various attractions that islands have to offer. For example, one family uh, give their account of their time island hopping and visiting Barra. I don't think I've got time to give that account. I'll just conclude by saying, Presiding Officer, our beautiful islands are there not to exist in isolation, but to be experienced, lived in and connected to our mainland. They are to be appreciated for their vibrant and productive communities, their generosity and their hospitality. Meeting with other small islands, collaborative and sharing ideas and best practice is the best way to ensure that whatever business opportunities are pursued, they are pursued with and for the communities themselves. I believe that's what this week's conference was about, and I congratulate Kenny Gibson for drawing it to our attention this week. Many thanks. And I now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Annabel Goldie. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and uh, I too congratulate uh, my colleague Kenneth Gibson on securing this debate. Uh, and as I mentioned, I chair the, the cross party group on recreational boating and marine tourism, so uh, I'm going to struggle to limit my comments to four minutes. Um, but uh, one point that, that Kenneth did mention uh, was an issue of uh, cruising, and I believe we'll, we'll have a, a members' debate uh, on the cruise industry. Uh, to, to Scotland next week, so I'm not going to say too much about that uh, today. But certainly today's debate certainly illustrates uh, once again the Scottish Parliament's commitment and also interest in, to cold water and marine tourism in Scotland, and also its appreciation uh, for the vast benefits drawn uh, from this important sector in our economy. And spending uh, by tourists in Scotland generates some £10 billion in economic activity and contributes roughly 5% of the country's GDP and the tourism sector also accounts for over 200,000 jobs and all of these numbers continue to rise thanks in part to the efforts of organisations like Visit Scotland and Visit Arran and conferences such as, uh, as the one that we're discussing today. Scotland's islands have recently been recognised on the world stage for their breathtaking beauty and unique opportunities that they afford to tourists. Uh, Lewis and Harris, uh, uh, they were named number five on the uh, TripAdvisor's list of the top islands in the world, beating out uh, much of its uh, tropical warm weathered competition. Uh, and it's also the high, highest ranked cold water islands and is surrounded uh, on the list by islands in warmer climates to the south. Although cold water islands uh, might not traditionally be thought of as uh, major tourist destinations, uh, this accolade acknowledges the beauty of our islands uh, and will also hopefully lead to more tourism in future years. And, uh, one of the issues that's come up uh, time and time again within the cross-party group on uh, recreational boating and marine tourism is just uh, how important uh, tourism is to the island communities across the country and in terms of uh, investment into the infrastructure uh, that's actually there, particularly the infrastructure regarding, uh, regarding marine tourism uh, activities, whether it's sailing, or boating, canoeing, kayaking, etc. Uh, and so this uh, investment into these activities certainly helps stimulate and promote uh, the, the, these island communities, uh, the economies in these island communities. Uh, and as we know, these are cold water communities. Certainly the cold water islands uh, offer a unique destination for tourists. Uh, that often includes uh, marine-based activities, handcrafts, archaeology, lessons about the history of Scotland, and also the island's inhabitants and the spectacular natural beauty of Scotland, as well as, as we've already heard today, the food and the drink aspects. Visitors to the islands uh, have the opportunity to get close to nature and also the dramatic landscape and to find insights into island life. As we've heard, uh, representatives from Scotland, Wales and Netherlands and Denmark, uh, amongst others, are meeting this week in Arran, uh, and to discuss the strategies to increase cold water tourism. And I'm sure, I'm certainly looking forward to actually finding out uh, the outcomes uh, as a consequence of the conference. One of the points that uh, my colleague uh, Kenneth Gibson mentioned was in terms of the recently published uh, strategy on marine tourism, the, the Awakening the Giant uh, publication. This actually started off in this parliament. 
It started off in the cross-party group on recreational boating and marine tourism, uh, when we held a symposium in March of two years ago. And as a consequence of that activity, uh, we've uh, got to this point of actually having uh, an actual marine tourism strategy for the country. So it's, uh, certainly, I'm going to take some credit for the cross-party group in actually uh, helping to fashion some type of marine strategy. And this is the first strategy, marine tourism strategy, that Scotland has actually ever had. So I just certainly want to put on the record uh, the work of the, of the cross-party group, but also the work of all cross-party groups in the Parliament in terms of the activities they can actually bring to the table to also help fashion uh, a policy agenda going forward. And once again, I want to thank uh, Kendra Gibson for bringing the uh, debate to the Chamber, and uh, so I, I'm sure that the conference will be a tremendous success. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Annabel Goldie to be followed by John Mason. Deputy Presiding Officer, can I too thank Kenny Gibson for bringing this important motion to the Parliament? And it's a very great pleasure to take part in this debate, um, loving Aaron as I do. I should mention I'm currently registering an interest relevant to the debate. On the 8th of March, I was a guest of the Arne Glasgow Society at their annual dinner when I spoke and I received hospitality and accommodation. The first annual European conference in cold water island tourism on the beautiful island of Arran is a triumph. It's a triumph for local resourcefulness and ingenuity. And I join others who have mentioned Alistair Dobson and pay tribute to him and to uh, visit Arran. The vision behind the initiative, as some have already mentioned, was making small cold water island destinations of choice, helping to make the islands sustainable economically, socially and environmentally, and also making the islands attractive places in which to live and work. Deputy Presiding Officer, the conference organisers couldn't have picked a better location for their conference. Arran is unique, close to the mainland and yet far from the bustle of the mainland. Diverse in scenery and recreational opportunity, noted for geology and tourism, and abundantly provided with quality accommodation and places to eat. So no wonder it enchants all who visit. And the conference mission was ambitious. It was to create, and I quote, a unique network of cold water small island destinations in order to benefit from having a representative voice of influence and forging collaborative working and sharing practical solutions based upon successful actions and evidence. A very purposeful and relevant uh, mission. And indeed, the conference prospectus describes the objectives as, amongst other things, sharing knowledge of successful practical projects, creating networks of expertise and information, discussing common issues and opportunities to grow the value of tourism, identifying solutions to underpin sustainable growth, and developing a common agenda for support and development, uh, amongst others. And I think that reflects a very practical and sensible um, approach to the potential, as other members have uh, indicated, the huge potential for uh, cold water islands. I couldn't help noticing the conference prospectus has a stunning photograph of Macri Bay, which uh, on my regular visits to Ireland was where I used to swim, Deputy Presiding Officer, and yes, cold water island is a good description. For many cold water maritime countries, their islands make a valuable contribution to the tourism experience and to the country's economy. And in terms of our understanding the value, the market demand and the economic impact, there has actually been comparatively little uh, research, as Stuart McMillan was indeed talking about. So any aim to redress that situation and recognise and identify cold water islands as viable tourist uh, destinations is is commendable. So this whole uh, initiative for Scotland is tailor-made, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it is also relevant to all our island communities. Island tourism can work hand-in-hand, -hand, of course, with island businesses, which do tend to be micro SMEs, and Arran is not short of successful local businesses who have forged themselves as providers of niche products sold well beyond the shores of Arran. Not only are these businesses vital for the overall survival of island communities, they do in themselves enhance and are enhanced by expanding tourism. So I too am delighted that this week over 100 delegates from across Northern Europe have gathered in Arran to hear success stories, listen to experts involved in the economic development of islands and build networks and friendships. This has been a unique event, the first ever conference examining cold water tourism. It's a feather in the cap for Scotland and it's a coup for the island of Arran. I congratulate all those who have been involved. 
Many thanks. And our last open debate speaker is John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank uh, Kenneth Gibson uh, for bringing this subject today? Can I also congratulate him on wearing the same tie as myself? Uh, for members who are not aware of that, it is the Enable charity uh, that three of us at least were wearing the tie today. For me, the ideal place to go on holiday is an island. The fact that you're surrounded by water certainly gives me the feeling of being away from it all and really being able to wind down and relax. And so today I thought I would be totally self-indulgent and talk about islands that I have visited. For example, last summer I spent nine days on Col and Tyree and had an absolutely superb time before the final few weeks of the referendum campaign. I'm not sure exactly when my attachment to islands came from, but as a youngster I do remember day trips to Millport eh, on Cumbria, and I had a teacher at school who took us eh, weekend trips to Arden, eh, which was also the last island I visited when the Finance Committee was there in December. As a student, I remember also going, a group of us going to Isla, and that is due to be my next island destination when the Equal Opportunities Committee goes there eh, right after the Westminster election. And I certainly hope to be camping when we go there, if the weather's better. And I think that is my ideal holiday of uh, being in an island and camping. Of course, not only Scotland has great islands, but other countries do too. A, a name I had always known from the shipping forecast a, was Lundy, which is off the north coast of Devon a, in England and well worth visiting. Ireland too has a number of islands, a, some of which I have visited, including Arden with one R, Rathlin across from Kintyre, and one of my most exciting island visits, which was to Clare Island, a, which is in my favourite Irish county of Mayo. The, the Irish allow competition on their ferry routes, and on a particularly windy and choppy day, eh, we had two ferries eh, racing across each other to, eh, across to the island together, and eh, it was eh, probably not safe, but it was good fun. Now, when we think of Wales, we might think of Anglesey or Innes Mon, as I believe it is known. However, the question then arises, is it really an island? It has two bridges, and that raises the question, how do we define an island? Now, I'm a fan of Hamish eh, Haswell Smith's book on Scottish islands, and I have to say I agree with his definition that an island has to be surrounded by seawater at lowest tide and have no permanent means of dry access. So by that definition, I'm afraid Anglesey is not an island, eh, and of course neither is Skye. And the Eust and Benbecula form one island, in my opinion, not three. But of course, the British Isles contain more than just Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales. The Isle of Man was a traditional holiday destination from Glasgow, and its location is stunning with all four surrounding nations in sight. Being there, you realise how central it was in the past, and the seas were the motorways of that time, and the Vikings knew that Man was right at the centre. And if it's history you're looking for, Jersey and Guernsey take some beating. The whole occupation story during World War II is absolutely fascinating and many of the fortifications can still be seen, which made the islands the most heavily fortified part of Hitler's Atlantic Wall. Continuing the war theme, the Faroe Islands were occupied by Britain in World War II, and it was the British who encouraged them to have and use their own flag, in contrast to the flag of Denmark, which of course at the time was occupied by Germany. When you stand, as I did a couple of years ago, in the Faroes, the closest country is Scotland. But it is disappointing to me, and to think to them, that there is no regular transport link. And I went by chartered plane, and I do wonder if the minister could look at transport links to the Faroes. Orkney perhaps grabs my attention because of its range of history. The Western Isles, Shetland also have their own councils. And although I'm a city dweller, I do support their having special treatment. Now, I hesitate to say I have a favorite island in Scotland. However, the one place that I had long wanted to go and visit, and which eventually I managed to, was St Kilda. When I did eventually manage it, it was absolutely superb. If you sail out, sail out from Lewis or Harris, you're almost out of sight of land, and then out of the middle of the ocean, like some spectacular film, come, come these cliffs, the amazing sea colour, and thousands of birds. The history and the evacuation in 1930 I find extremely moving, eh, and there is a magic about the place. However, I do reckon it is somewhat spoiled by the military buildings, and if I can finish with two suggestions, one would be to the minister to get rid of the military buildings, if he can do that. And I think it would be a good project for Scotland to repopulate St Kilda. Mr Presiding Mason, could I ask you to draw to a close? Yes. Perhaps we'd like to come back to Aaron, uh, if yeah. possible. OK, well, presiding officer, I, I, I welcome this conference of islands coming to Scotland. The islands are one of our great assets, and let us do all we can to encourage and support them. Thank you. Many thanks. Can I now invite uh, Derek Mackay to respond to the debate, Minister, around seven minutes or so.
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to be able to speak in today's debate and congratulate Kenny Gibson on securing the debate on the Arran Coldwater Islands Tourism Conference and so to congratulate North Ayrshire Council for their vision in supporting this inaugural event. Uh, you might wonder why I'm responding. Of course, it's because I've got ministerial responsibility for the islands. It isn't just that Fergus Ewing was not available as the tourism minister, but Malcolm Chisholm rather helpfully made the point about transport connections and how we can make cultural connections through transport as well and the capacity uh, that we've got there. So it's a uh, clear uh, linkage. And I would also not want you to draw any conclusion from the fact that I've been holidaying in Arran for about the last 10 years. I'm not permitted to have a favourite island, but you can draw your own conclusions from the fact that I'm a regular visitor. And as Annabelle Goldie has described it, I may have uh, visits to declare, but I think they're all uh, at my own expense or or in a couple of uh, government uh, events been over there too. But what's uh, struck me is the entrepreneurial spirit in Arran, and how people work together is certainly uh, very impressive. And in terms of the Cold Water Conference, it maybe conjures up an image that not all tourism partnerships would want, having swam in the, the coast of Arran as well. But I can reveal a public health message. I've also been sunburnt too uh, in Arran. Uh, so there is certainly warmth of hospitality and the sun, uh, the sun does, does often uh, shine uh, as well. But this is about the, the conference, which is a, a fantastic event in bringing together partners and stakeholders to release the potential um, of islands. And of course, the uh, involvement of Visit Arran and Taste of Arran in the conference is further evidence of close working and highly successful relationships across the whole island. And again, commend uh, the branding uh, therein. It's also a conference in one of which is the support from Visit Scotland through their conference bid fund. And I hope this sends a clear message about how the conference bid fund can support businesses and conferences uh, across Scotland, not just uh, in the cities, but in rural areas uh, as well. Uh, the bid fund can be for conferences from 50 to 5,000 delegates, all of which play a vital role in boosting the visitor economy in Scotland and acting as a showcase for all that Scotland has to offer. is somewhere to live, study and learn from, invest, buy from and visit again and again. And of course, Arran has many attractions, stunning scenery, a range of activities for all tastes and levels of fitness, plus delicious locally produced food and drink, including the local distillery at uh, Loch Ranza and the Arran Blonde series of beers and a range of delights from chocolate to cheese and ice cream to rapeseed oil and show that Arran is a microcosm of what Scotland has to offer. Of course, Arran aromatics uh, and many others, including that sense of destination. But in terms of food and drink, that's why in this 2015, as the year of food and drink, it offers so much for the industry to become involved in, building on the global exposure that Scotland has had in 2014. Let's capitalise uh, on that. And of course, the conference recognises that as well as our food and drink, Scotland is also doubly blessed with the asset of a great network of coastal assets and inland waterways too, facilitating a range of routes, uh, marine tourism from the Nordics may take an interest in the, the market potential and expanding that blue traffic as has mentioned by, been mentioned by others uh, through all seasons. And the conference programme clearly recognises Aaron seizing the initiative and thinking about how to position all attractions and enterprises, not only within 2015, but the other themed years from 2016 through to 2018. And there is European attention as well. And as uh, Kenneth Gibson has remarked, I'm equally pleased that uh, Johan Gilly from Ecoris Consulting has been working closely with the European Commission, DG Mayor, uh, speaking on the connectivity and innovative tourism strategies for, for Ireland's uh, perspective. Scotland does stand to benefit from an EC focus on marine resources and we've been active in shaping European thinking in these sectors. And Stuart McMillan, MSP, has mentioned as convener of the cross-party group on recreational boating and marine tourism uh, the potential that it has and has had good engagement uh, with uh, Commission officials uh, as well. Visit Scotland has also fielded a speaker at the EC Conference of Coastal and Marine Tourism in Venice last year. And I know that uh, the EC DG uh, Mayor have been most impressed in their contacts to date with Scottish activity around coastal and marine tourism. So it is vital that Scotland continues to provide positive input, such as this conference, as the emerging pan-European approach to marine and coastal tourism is being actively uh, developed. 
The potential for using mar marine tourism as a means of opening up coastal areas has been long recognised and features an approach in our work to date on the National Marine Plan and of course the National Planning Framework uh, as well, which I was able to lead. The Visit Scotland National Tourism Development Framework shows an estimated £336 million worth of investment in tourism infrastructure impacting across all of Ayrshire and Arran over the next three years, further enhancing the quality of the visitor experience. The industry-led Scottish Marine Tourism Development Group launched a strategic framework for Scotland's marine tourism sector on the 5th of March and will we'll put further energy into the right kind of infrastructure and the right decisions there to support this work. Crucially, as the conference recognises, this is not about just how to grow the marine sector, but to ensure that sustainable economic growth carries across to coastal communities, inland waterways and the wider tourism businesses to provide an authentic visitor experience. A conference to promote, celebrate and help tourism on small cold water island destinations around the world is visionary and timious. The Scottish Government, for one, would welcome receiving further detail on the conference outcomes once they become available and continue to work in partnership. Clearly, the conference will help us to understand not only how we can further increase all that islands such as Arran has to offer uh, the visitor, but also what more is possible for all our islands in Scotland, whether that's transport or tourism or marketing or infrastructure or Visit Scotland, the partnership uh, will all come together to learn the lessons from this conference and clearly key to successful delivery of sustainable economic growth via the various sectors within our tourism industry will be that partnership working which Aaron has showcased and I think been something of an exemplar of to develop an attractive model for all and particularly tourism to ensure that our islands in Scotland have a long and sustainable and successful future going forward. Many thanks, Minister. And that concludes Kenneth Gibson's debate on European Conference for Coldwater Island Tourism. And I now suspend this meeting until 2.30 p.m.